today. He is going to be uh, talking about multi-segment preserving sampling for deep manifold samplers. Um, currently, he is a full-time uh, machine learning scientist at Prescient Design, which is a Genetech accelerator. He is also a PhD student at NYU. Just a reminder, um, throughout the seminar, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. There will also be the opportunity to ask questions and unmute yourself at the end. So with that, Dan, whenever you're ready to take it away, thank you. All right. Thanks, Meg. Uh, and thank you to the organizers of the ML for Protein Engineering seminar for to give this talk. I'm really excited. And uh, also a special thanks to Sting Ra uh, for putting in, in touch with the organizers as well. Um, so like, uh, like Meg said, I'm a PhD student and a machine learning engineer at uh, Prescient Design. And uh, I'm advised by uh, Rich Bonneau and Kyung Yin Cho at NYU. So let's just sort of uh, go ahead. Oh, there we go. Um, so at a high level, I'm going to uh, uh, present our work on multi-segment preserving sampling. Um, and what this uh, method is, is a, it is an, a, uh, it is an alternative sort of sampling procedure for um, you know, generating protein sequences, uh, alternative to the uh, procedure that was presented in, in uh, this function guided design paper, uh, Gaborievich et al. Uh, in 2021, in which we presented, we uh, introduced the, this deep manifold sampler for protein sequences. And essentially, what this uh, model, this method uh, does, is it allows us to introduce um, or impose sort of explicit inductive biases on the inputs of our of, of the sampling regime um, in latent space. Um, so. What that means in terms of sort of input output, uh, essentially, uh, in order to run uh, multi-segment preserving sampling, we need a trained deep manifold sampler, which I will uh, describe in the subsequent slides. Um, we need a seed sequence S, which is simply a sequence of tokens. Um, in this case, you know, protein sequence. Um, and in, in, for this work, uh, we use antibody sequences. We're interested in just designing antibody sequences. And thirdly, the uh, third input to this method is a collection of intervals uh, in which uh, uh, essentially these intervals are describing the regions along the sequence, which we do not want to perturb or we want to uh, hold fixed. And this sort of uh, speaks to the you know, core of the method. Essentially, what we're doing is we're specifying a, a list of segments that we'd like to preserve and uh, allowing sampling to proceed along the rest of the on the rest of the sequence. And this is done inside of the latent space uh, in a sense that you know we're traveling along the manifold, but only in select directions that allow us to uh, modify the regions of interest. And in particular, um, just to highlight essentially what the method is doing. Um, we're going to return a collection of sequence designs, uh, some number of them, that satisfy the condition on the bottom right, which is essentially uh, stating that uh, along every interval that was specified, uh, along, uh, along every inter interval that was specified, these design sequence now uh, essentially matches the subsequence in the seed. Um, and that is the, uh, this, this is essentially the method, the core of the method. And so before I describe how residue or multi-segment preserving sampling works, I'd like to first uh, provide some background on how, what is the deep manifold sampler. So the deep manifold sampler is a transformer based uh, autoencoder that uh, essentially Trained on you know some collection of protein sequences, and it's uh, intended for this sort of biological sequence design. Uh, and so what that means is uh, in, the, in, in sort of the classic uh, denoising autoencoder setup, what we're going to do is we're going to take it, we're going to take a unperturbed sequence X, uh, sample a new uh, sequence called X tilde uh, by using a some kind of corruption process. Um, this is a discrete corruption process, and it's something like, um, you know, delete a few residues here, uh, insert some residues over there, 
uh, maybe swap out some residues in another place. And what we're going to obtain, like I said, is this uh, X tilde and a change in the length of the sequence. So that th this is sort of one of the um, attractive parts of the deep manifold sampler um, framework. Essentially, the, the, the model learns to um, you know, be able to essentially denoise not only mutations, but also indels in the sequence. And so how, how it works is essentially we're going to, you know, what we've done is we've sort of engineered a, a delta L and we've uh, corrupted a sequence. We uh, encode this sequence into a, in some latent dimension called Z tilde. You can think of this as the sort of the learned manifold. Eventually, you know, the Q theta kind of captures a, a manifold of sequences that are, um, you know, it's like a low dimensional representation that uh, is essentially is supposed to describe sequence vari variability or, you know, believable naturalness of uh, sequences. And uh, we, you know, we use this in, in order to A, uh, train and sort of an aux auxiliary delta L sort of length predictor. So it's going to, we're going to be able to sort of, sort of um, in the training phase, we're actually going to sort of classify uh, whether or not, you know, how changed is the sequence? Like how, how, how much is the length changed? Is it, it, it trained by sort of you know, minus three, or plus two, you know, zero, et cetera. Um, and in an inference phase, we can sort of sample new lengths by, um, you know, providing the Z tilde and then, uh, you know, sampling a multinomial that the, this classifier has sort of emits, at, uh, you know, given this input. Um, so, you know, so this, this module is essentially like a length predictor. Um, we, um, sorry, uh, this, you know, the second sort of stage of this model is we take the uh, corrupted Z tilde and we transform it into the, you know, the known length. Uh, th this is in the training phase. We transform our, our sequence uh, from, you know, some corrupted sequence of some length back into the original sequence. So essentially, here we're we're learning a, a length transformation that is a prompt, you know, essentially, you know, it's described in this this work, and it uh, it is a sort of local average or smoothing of the uh, latent in, embedding, either to expand or contract it in uh, its, uh, you know, it, the number of rows that it that it uh, uh, described it. So we use this length transformation, you know, we we transform back the sequence back into its. Uh, uh, original length and then decode and uh, in the you know training phase essentially you know we, we evaluate the cross entropy loss of the sequence and in the sampling phase we're, we're able to sample from the uh, logits by um, you know applying a soft max and then sampling from the like multinomial what, and what this captures is sort of a non autoregressive um, language model that uh, is capable of modulating the length of a protein sequence. There's also this auxiliary uh, oracle, which I'll describe in the next slide, but essentially we can also co-train um, a oracle or pseudo oracle that's able to predict some property of the sequence. So for example, in, a, in the original sort of work, what we did was we trained a, um, function, a, a function oracle that uh, learned to optim learned to uh, classify uh, go terms, and so what this allows us to do is, uh, you know, based on this latent embedding, we're able to infer the length, uh, you know, the, the true sort of length of the sequence. We're also able to infer uh, the functions of the sequence. Um, so that is the uh, sort of the general sort of deep manifold sampler framework. And uh, in the original function guide design paper. Uh, we we proposed sort of a, a gradient guided design framework. What, what this means is uh, using the same sort of model, um, we are in the inference phase are able to apply this corruption process, you know, essentially discard this uh, true delta L because here in this case we're sort of searching for uh, new protein sequences. Uh, provide this X tilde into the encoder, AKA sort of embedded onto the manifold. We then take the uh, embedded sequence 
uh, provide it to the length predictor. And like I said, we can now sample sort of the, the uh, sample from the multinomial distribution of this uh, uh, given by the length predictor, which, which will uh, provide sort of a collection of uh, delta Ls that we can then provide to this length transformation. Um, and then uh, there, thereby, uh, you know, inducing sort of a collection of, um, you know, sort of, proc you know, not yet decoded outputs, still, still sort of hidden representations, but now they are length transformed. Um, and then we can uh, essentially decode and apply and therefore obtain sort of uh, new sequences by sampling again from the you know logits that were reported by the transform decoder, and in case uh, where we have attached sort of a pseudo oracle to it, um, we can also sort of in, um, use this pseudo oracle in order to guide design. The idea is that um, since this oracle sort of lives on the manifold, it's consuming uh, these corrupted in, uh, or sort of the, these latent inputs. Um, and reporting the whatever label associated that is associated with this sequence, um, we're able to then sort of take the derivative of this output of the oracle with respect to the manifold input, and therefore sort of you know that gradient it, it provides a direction that we can follow um, in in the latent space in order to um, enrich the representation with uh, with a um, Enrich the representation with the you know information that regarding the you know the 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 label that were of interest. And so you know as a concrete sort of example, um, here what we, what we did was uh, you know we started with this beta protein that uh, had some collection of known functions. Um, so you can imagine that in, you know a perfectly trained oracle is going to report these functions, and then we sort of guided by uh, providing this. Uh, second, this um, completely foreign to the to to you know this beta protein's uh, function, and over a long sampling trajectory, we were able to obtain you know this helical protein with the functions enriched uh, in, in with the you know sort of the oracle is now reporting functions that are uh, analogous to the to the function that we're seeing here. And just a sort of a pictorial representation, what, what, what's happening here is we're um, essentially, we're providing a direction on the manifold to travel so that we can uh, optimize the sequence for a given property, um, which is great. I mean, you know, this is, a, this is a really powerful result for traversing, you know, through sequence space. Uh, we can, you know, essentially provide a, a starting point and iteratively corrupt and uh, essentially apply this MCMC Sampling procedure and obtain a, uh, a, a sequence that you know essentially looks believable. Tr Rosetta folded in, into a helical protein, but all of this um, all this procedure requires a lot of data. Um, just to you know put a few numbers on it, the pseudo oracle is essentially trained on you know greater than five hundred thousand uh, function annotations, and the transformer is trained on something like. Uh, millions and millions of PFAM sequences. And so um, in, in, a, in a low data regime, it, uh, this becomes prohibitive. You, we can no longer do gradient guided design. And addition, additionally, you know, perhaps this oracle uh, is not uh, in, informed by the hidden representation. There could be, uh, you, you know, the, the these, the, whatever this latent dimension captures, it could not be correlated with some uh, property of interest. And so this tight, tight coupling to the deep manifold sampler is also you know, not exactly advantageous. Um, so this is the, you know, sort of the gradient guided design framework that we seek to replace with multi-segment preserving sampling. And in order to uh, sort of test this method out, um, we decided to train instead on um, antibodies, which provides sort of a nice uh, testing ground for a method in which there is strong inductive prior on what, what regions of the sequence should be sampled uh, or redesigned. And in, in this case, um, just a you know, brief 
overview of uh, you know the way I understand an antibody. Um, that it's com it's composed of essentially a heavy and a light chain. Uh, the there's this sort of variable region that uh, is known to bind to a target antigen, and this target when it binds, it's a uh, you know, what this what we can say is that it's now neutralized the anti antigen and it's sort of signaled for uh, some kind of cleanup uh, by you know some kind of cell cleanup or something like that. Uh, but uh, you know what this means for us is there are essentially just a few loop regions that we are interested in redesigning, and the rest of the framework can be held fixed. Um, and hence, you know, in a this seems like a great place to uh, test out the multi-segment preserving sampling uh, sort of method. So this is a uh, so just moving forward. Um, we apply this to protein sequences and, uh, sorry, antibody sequences, and um, it's, it, in particular, we're, we're interested in uh, changing changing only the CDRs. And so this is just sort of a pictorial representation of what's happening here. Um, you can imagine that this is a region that we would like to copy over. Uh, it's the framework region, and maybe uh, you know this area is is something that we'd like to redesign, right? Uh, yes, so what uh, it, what we're doing here is in, you know, sort of panel B is we apply the corruption. Um, some of these, these corrupted inputs are not, um, not considered because they, you know, we do, we, we would not like to, uh, we'd like to preserve that region, but we do allow, uh, you know, design to happen along, along these, uh, you know, post, you know, pre and post fixes of the of the preserved sequence. And so that this is just sort of a pictorial representation of, of what's happening here. Um, still performing the MCMC, uh, but we're not allowing some regions to be modified. And so the way that this works is just going back briefly, just to remind, um, you know, it's still the same, sort of the same model. And so we have a, a length predictor that reports one delta L. And this uh, oracle is no longer attached to the manifold sampler. And so we're essentially just running you know, this, this subgraph of, the, of this picture. Um, but uh, in order to uh, allow length changes along regions of the sequence of, that we're interested in, we change. We assign sub deltas. We can, you know, say that our uh, the, ch the change in length will be sort of proportional to the size of the interval of interest. And so here, um, what, we're, what we're stating is basically, you know, if we're standing on some interval that has some length, we're going to consider it. We're going to consider it, you know, how much, uh, you know, sort of length mass it's it, it uh, takes up in on, over the entire collection of intervals and we multiply by some reported by the length predictor delta l this and this yields you know some sub delta which is a which is less than the original delta the, the delta l that we're multiplying here and if you were to run over the um, intervals you would and sum over sum over their sub deltas. You would you know recapitulate this delta L. So what well, that's all to say essentially what we what we're doing here is we re, we report this delta and then break it apart and apply it to various regions of the sequence. Um, so this controls the length modulation. And secondly, there's this uh, second sort of mechanism called beta. Or hyperparameter beta, which controls the copyover of the encoder representation into the sort of length length transform representation. So you can imagine um, now that we're dealing with two sort of representations, we have the encoder representation of a preserved region, and we have we've now we apply this you know blur or uh, smoothing to the um, so the hidden representation, uh, which moves it in, in the manifold in some meaningful way to the model. 
um, and what we're in order to inform the model that, hey, we'd like to preserve this region or we'd only like to move so far in certain areas on, uh, in, in this embedding dimension um, where we, we apply sort of a, a convex domination of the encoder representation or sorry, the encoder representation and the length transformed representation. And um, you know, this could be, this would be impossible if we tried to do it sort of an all to all convex, company, com, uh, convex combination in the sense that, you know, this, this, uh, this H um, is potentially longer or sh shorter than this Z, um, but we perform this at sort of at a residue level. So, um, you know, only certain regions of the sequence are, are uh, enriched with this convex combination. And so basically, if you are um, not part of the, uh, the the preserved regions, then you'll just we'll, we'll just, just uh, you know sort of, or sorry, if you're part of the preserved regions, we'll, we'll copy over your sequence. And if you're not part of the uh, preserved regions, then we're going to perform this uh, strange convex combination move. And just to make sure, so that we can decode in the right way, we. Um, Sort of hack the logits of the last of the last in the last layer, so that when we uh, perform this sampling, we guarantee that uh, the preserved regions resolve uh, as the preserved regions we expect. And um, the reason why the, so what's happening essentially here is that in this stage we change the length in the in this new sort of uh, way that only expands or contracts certain areas of the sequence. In this stage we make a move in latent space that is uh, meaningful in the context of preserving certain certain areas of the sequence um, you know the the representations of uh, the preserved regions don't change too much and then when we decode we just we're just saying you know sample uh, you know decode into the original areas that you into the original sort of identities that you had before and if you are not part of the uh, preserved area, then just uh, you know decode decode as you would have earlier. Hope that makes sense. Um, so this is essentially how it works. And we applied uh, we we ran a few experiments, um, like I said, using you know antibodies. Uh, we and we evaluated with sort of three sort of metrics. So. In, you know the way that the way that we trained the model is we took paired chains from the observed antibody space, um, so heavy and light chains, and um, trained the, trained the model to consume these inputs, uh, and then evaluated by simply taking a look at how much are we changing the length of uh, you know regions that we allowed to sample. Ideally, the MCMC is not going to go crazy and sort of emit a uh, uh, you know, CDR or, uh, you know, other designed regions that are way too long or way too short. Um, so this is, you know, the, what we're trying to describe here uh, that we didn't go sort of too crazy with the sampling. Um, the second piece that we, uh, the second way that we evaluate is by training a surrogate GPT-2 model on a collection of antibody sequences, sampling only the CDRs, and then looking at the log likelihood of the samples and the log likelihood of the training set and confirming that there are essentially um, oh, there's overlap in the distribution of log likelihoods. And finally, we took a look at the edit distances to the seed uh, using this sort of sampling framework. Um, so just to sort of run through these results, um, we varied beta, uh, this copy over parameter from zero to 0 0.9. And uh, you can see that to, for in, in, you know, in, essentially in each plot, in each panel, we are recapitulating the, uh, the CDR length distribution of each, uh, of each sequence. So that's you know, great. Essentially, it's just a sanity check stating that we didn't move in some uncharacterized, you know, unpredictable way uh, to the degree that now our CDR sequences don't even match the training set distribution. So that was uh, a positive thing. Uh, the second uh, 
way that we evaluated, like I said, we we did this uh, took this log likelihood of, uh, under a some this external surrogate train model, varied the betas, sampled our sequences, um, and then uh, you know essentially uh, confirmed that you know to a to a substantial degree, or you know we, we're matching log likelihoods. There is some shift here. Uh, which you know essentially could mean that some of our some of our CDR sequences that we're sampling are um, you know not recognized by the GPT two model, and you know the interpretation there is that maybe some of these sequences are novel and you know not drawn from the OAS. Um, so essentially, here you know it's 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 reliable enough, but maybe there's some novelty. And finally, we uh, looked into the total number of edits of this sequence, um, and to a you know with a with modest uh, to a modest level, as you increase the copy over, which or you decrease the copy over. Essentially, what this is saying is uh, we'd like to we'd you know for beta equal to zero point nine, we're only we're more we're considering more the length transformer representation than the encoder representation. Beta equal to zero, we're, consi we're considering more almost exclu you know, in exclusively the encoder representation. Um, and so to a modest degree, our, uh, you know, as you sort of decrease the copy over, we see, you know, more edits. And that tells us that there's to, uh, again, a modest degree, we are, uh, Moving farther along in, in on this uh, sequence manifold, and you know, in one example, uh, our CDR sequences um, seem to you know have this monotonically incre increasing uh, edit distance. So for beta equal to zero point nine, again, you know, the, the CDR sequences were um, more redesigned than in the uh, original sort of. Uh, you know, beta, you know, copying over the encoder representation completely. So this would we we viewed this as a, a positive that beta to some degree it does control the way that we move it in the latent space. Uh, but there's no free lunch with this method. And of course there are some limitations. Uh, in general, um this delta, the way that we distribute this delta L is um, biased in a, in a way. First of all, we're biasing towards the relative based on the size of the interval. And so what, uh, what this means is that uh, large intervals are likely to change in length more than short intervals. And so you can imagine if there was only a few residues that you wanted to, you know, perhaps you want to redesign some small region and then you also want to redesign some large region, that large region is going to receive sort of more delta L mass. And what that means is um, you, might, you might not explore regions of the uh, sequence space uh, for that small region that uh, could have been sort of viable. Um, I guess we could pr uh, propose sort of a, one possible solution is just to jitter the, uh, the, the sub deltas. And so, um, you, you distribute according to the policy that I uh, described earlier, which I'll just go back to. Um, you know, here's here's the here's the relative size of the interval, and we're multiplying by delta L. Um, so you can imagine uh, we're going to uh, obtain a list of sub deltas, and then just shuffle the list, and that gives us a, a way to um, maybe in a less principled manner, but it, it still allows us to sort of um, vary the, the small regions. Uh, with large deltas and perhaps not vary the uh, small large regions with uh, large deltas. So that this that, you know this isn't that concerning, uh, but you know still a uh, still an issue. The second uh, issue is that there's a this length transformation is a mechanism. It's not it, there is a one learned parameter, and it is. Uh, as I said earlier, it's the, the purpose of it is to simply um, sort of smooth out the representation so that we can obtain a hidden matrix of this of a different size. And this uh, 
this may be, this may, might not mean, uh, this might change the way that the, the model views the sequence. Um, you know, it could confound this sort of manifold position when you perform this blurring. And since, since it's crucial to the method that we are performing this copy over and uh, using the, uh, the you know, using the length trans Link transformed outputs as a sort of viable representation. There's, uh, you know, it, it might sort of confound what's what's happening here. There, 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 you know, there's probably some easier way to change length uh, without, you know, breaking down the representation that you had previously. And one, you know, way that we could propose um, to do, perform length changes is the convenient part of antibodies is that they're really well studied. There are antibody numbering schemes. Uh, there's a you know, max length that uh, many researchers have agreed on that uh, antibodies can sort of fill. And so since there's sort of this canonical reference frame, we can apply that inductive bias and implement length changes, not through a length, uh, length predictor, but instead uh, just inserting or deleting gap characters in, in sort of a, you can imagine like a, an alignment string. And so, uh, again, uh, an issue, but not uh, exactly the, you know, it's not the end of the world. Uh, but this third point is uh, pretty concerning in that the carryover is um, not the, not, it may be performing moves in the, in the latent space that the, the, map, the model is not familiar with. And so when it decodes, it, you know, we could be essentially mapping the model, mapping the sequence down into a, a region of the latent space that was, uh, that is uncharacterized in the, uh, so, so it was uncharacterized during training. And this could lead to essentially make perhaps in the worst case, uh, a sort of sampling from um, like a, essentially just a uniform distribution of residues, uh, in, in the regions that we are trying to redesign, or uh, you know, another interpretation of this is we are making moves that force us to ignore valuable regions of the sequence manifold uh, simply because the you know this mechanism onto the, the model that is uh, it was not part of the training dynamics, and for the life of me, I cannot uh, exactly spitball some uh, you know simple solution to this issue. So uh, that's slightly problematic. But one um, perhaps more principled approach to performing a uh, sort of a multi-segment preserving sampling uh, method would be instead to follow uh, what uh, doing more dots and now Tukasovska at all uh, Propose, which is to uh, train a compositional EBM to uh, that you know sort of captures the data manifold and is able to report energy scores that, uh, for data points, and then sample the uh, new sequences using Langevin uh, diffusion. And um, in practice, what this means, what this what this model learns is that there are. Uh, you know, sort of low entropy regions of the, of the sequence, like the framework that uh, ought not to be modified or very parsimoniously changed. And, it, you know, in the case of, for example, CDR H3, uh, this sequence, this, uh, you know, the, the model may propose uh, more drastic sort of edits. And again, when you, you know, sort of you train using this, uh, this this AHO or you know the the number uh, an antibody numbering scheme you no longer need a a uh, length changer you you're implementing edit uh, indels by inserting or deleting uh, or you know mutating gap characters um, and so when you perform this sort of launch of an MCMC uh, yeah you're not it does not require this uh, induce this this mechanism for um, you know, tr transforming the latent space, and it uh, essentially is a you know in a, in a hand wavy way, it's a more principled approach to uh, to uh, multi segment preserving sampling, um, in the sense that we're not going to move 
in a strange way on the manifold any longer. Uh, so that's essentially uh, most of what I have. I mean, uh, we this is work that I have been doing with um, the uh, Prussian Design Crew, which is a fully integrated ML AI organization of uh, Genentech. We were blessed. Uh, essentially, what this group is is an interdisciplinary group of computational biologists, engineers, machine learning scientists, where we're tasked with uh, biologic uh, design. Um, so, uh, what this, what our organization is composed of, is essentially four arms uh, that allow us to stand up some kind of you know, molecular design platform. Namely, um, we have a structural and computational biology group, which is you know, concerned with sort of maybe more mechanistic modeling of, of prote protein sequences and character characterization of our sample of our designs. Um, we have a machine learning uh, group that. Has, is uh, essentially the cast of, of folks that are proposing uh, generative generative models and sampling schemes that allow us to form, uh, you know, propose uh, new sequences that we might may or may not test in the lab. Um, we have thirdly, we have that sort of frontiers research group, which is was which is led by Kang and Cho, which is a um, group of more theoretical machine learning scientists who are more, uh, you know, farther looking and uh, concerned with developing theoretical ML that eventually may sort of percolate down to the machine learning group and uh, be used for the, you know, sort of concrete task or application of drug design. And finally, uh, we have a collection of uh, extremely talented software engineers who are, have been tasked with using, uh, you know, using the methods that are developed by the top three groups, um, and you know, standing up a molecular design platform that allows us to sort of revolutionize the way that our drug design, uh, that we perform drug design, and accelerate the loop, and uh, etc. And so, with that, um, I'm happy to take questions and or you know clarify. Um, parts of the talk that uh, may need more explanation. Um, if you'd like to be in contact with the, uh, any, any of us, here are, uh, here's a collection of uh, Twitter handles uh, for our various founders and line leads. And uh, please check us out on our website, which is listed here as well. And yes, so thank you. Thank you for uh, the invite. Happy to take questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dan. So um, I'm going to start reading some questions from the chat, but um, in between, if anyone wants to unmute and ask a question, um, you also have the ability to do so. So uh, the first question comes from Hunter. He said, one of the goals of introducing the constraint on certain sequence regions was to improve data efficiency, correct? What sort of increases in data efficiency do you see? Um, I'm not totally sure what data efficiency means, but uh, essentially what it, what it, this what this allows us to do uh, when we perform this sort of this multi, let's see, what's the right? Uh, I'll just go here. When, when we perform this in multi-segment preserving sampling, um, it allows us to vary regions of the sequence of it that are interest, interesting and um, not vary regions of the sequence that what, you know, may essentially just break the fold or you know, break the sequence entirely. In the context of antibodies, this means changing uh, perhaps the, only the CDR loops. Um, and from an efficiency perspective, I guess there's sort of two, two ways you can interpret that. Um, the first is a more of a negative. It's there is no efficiency in, in sort of the training. The training, the training dynamics are exactly the same. Uh, you know, we're changing the we're changing the length of the sequence, encoding, uh, co-training a length predictor that predicts the actual delta L that was that was uh, induced by this corruption. Um, you know, transforming the in, the, uh, the the this encoded representation into a, a new length. 
uh, in particular, the length of the original sequence and then decoding, computing cross entropy loss. So the, the, the sequence is still, um, or the, the data efficiency is uh, exactly the same as you know, the gradient guided design frameworks uh, data efficiency. Uh, in terms of sampling efficiency, I guess there's an argument that uh, our, our model is, or this method is um, exploring regions of the sequence manifold that are more of interest. So in the classic sort of MCMC um, setup, uh, the idea is that MCMC will left unchecked, it will traverse and all, all around the manifold and obtain uh, and be able to sample essentially every sequence that you would ever be able to uh, uh, obtain just by uh, you know, doing a you know, sort of a random walk along, along the manifold. In this case, we're performing this constraint that uh, is, is essentially just, you know, let's, um, let's, only, let's only explore regions of this induced manifold that are um, particularly of interest for this like biologic design. And yeah, I, I hope that sort of answers the question. Um, Awesome. So Marshall Case asked, have you ever experimented with changing the framework region and CDR together with data sets that include clonotypes, families of antibodies? Um, is that a, if that's a question about whether we sort of perform sort of unguided or unconstrained sampling, uh, the answer is yes. Um, and uh, to some degree, I mean, of course, we we still see a you know less perturbations on the um, uh, in the uh, framework regions, whereas in the uh, you know in the CDRs, since they're generally higher entropy, you just consider the this huge sort of like list of all antibody sequences. The, the of course the alignment uh, is going to vary more in those CDR regions, and uh, so. Uh, what you know, what we see is like mild residue, per, uh, multi-segment per preserving sampling. It's just, but it essentially, you know, I'm going to say it's just it's by accident, you know, just but just by nature of the the, the way that the the data sort of presents itself. Um, so, yes. Awesome. Anna Lujan asks, how many mutations does your model make per variant? It, is, is that a question about, I'm sorry, I keep on asking, uh, you know, what is, what is the nature of the question? Uh, if, the, if that means, you know, what is the, how much, mod, how many modifications we make per seed? Um, that is a really interesting question. I don't know offhand. Uh, there, but the one answer is that some some seed sequences, um, especially if you're drawing them from a set that is not the observed antibody space, some sequences are already sort of off the manifold. And so, you if you encode, I'll go back to the, you know the, this uh, description, visual description. If you encode sort of a sequence that is not was you know was not sort of explored during this corruption process and decoding, decoding sort of regime, um, then when you embed, you're going to land on, it, on some point, and that point is not necessarily on the manifold. And so when, you, when this happens um, and you perform sampling or you know, residue preserving sampling, Us. you know you, you know you, you know maybe there's a, a way that you you know perhaps there's you know you could essentially you could argue that now that we're just sampling from a null model where the frameworks are preserved and you just randomly you randomly sample cdr loops or whatever the other, you know any any region of interest um so i hope that answers the questions uh you know so, so what that you know what that means for the uh in the context of you know edits per variant um, for well-behaved variants, if variants and seeds are the same thing, uh, for well-behaved variants, meaning on the manifold, we're going to see you know, more, more parsimonious edits 
that uh, you know are essentially something like moving along this manifold uh, and you know changing this changing in sort of deliberate ways. And for well uh, poorly behaved variants, uh, we're going to um, essentially um, just continue to be off the manifold. W what, you know where we where we travel in in this uh, you know high you know this this latent space is uh, unpredictable simply because the training the training did not capture the, the, those sequences. I mean, for example, like you know you provide an enzyme to this uh, this antibody trained model. Um, the what you know what might happen is it's going to uh, it's going to be very confused. You know, uh, you're saying you know preserve some regions of the sequence that the, you know when you embed those those preserved regions, it's going you know what uh, there's you know it, it's almost um, we 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 can't predict where you know what the embedding will look like there when you you know when you essentially project an enzyme sequence into into this antibody manifold and you know you, you choose to you choose to sample some regions of this sequence it's going to be you know at at best what would happen is it, it might you know sort of push it towards the antibody manifold and you know perhaps try to create a cdr out of uh, out of some just random substring of the sequence or um, what have you so hope that answers the question awesome i might have missed this at the beginning but um is there any chance that um, this model will be like generalized to use for other drug designs that are beyond antibodies, or is it pretty antibody specific because of like the CDRs and how you're embedding them? That's a good question. Um, in principle, you could uh, use this method on anything. Uh, so for example, again, with, with enzymes, you might have a family of enzymes that you're quite interested in. And there, in, uh, perhaps what you'd like to uh, modify is the catalytic triad of, of your sequences. And so, um, you know, you, you would provide the sequences uh, to this. You know, you train you train a model on the, on this family of, of enzymes or all enzymes. You know, you know this is a heuristic that you'd you'd maybe have to figure out. Um, and uh, you would proceed by choosing to preserve certain regions of that sequence and then, um, sample sample new parts of the of the sequence like the catalytic triad and so the answer is something like yes uh, you can apply it to other uh, methods but um, we haven't tested it on other methods uh, sorry other fa protein families um, and in the context of sort of like a general protein language model, like, you know, your ESM, your progen, um, what this model, I'm, I'm not sure what, what the, what the model might do there, you know, when you, when you sample, when you choose to preserve certain regions of, of the sequence. I mean, you can think of this as like, I mean, at the end of the day, the same sort of math works out uh, with a sort of a hidden mark marked off model. So if you, you know, you sample from a, you know, you can, you can essentially like choose to sample certain regions. Uh, you, you know, you, you can imagine like you're gonna you're gonna sample you're sampling from some kind of alignment. And if you trained on like essentially all protein sequences, then there's a, a you're confronted with a situation where there are all regions of the alignment are high entropy, and that could bode poorly for the you know design uh, sort of. Uh, the design of these sequences. With the gradient guided design, however, it does make a little bit more sense. You know, you when you embed these sequences, you, know, you train on, on you know some large corpus of protein sequences, and with the assumption that you know semantics of one protein family inform semantics of another protein family by nature of you know evolution and uh, you know sequence similarity. Um, you can imagine a, uh, a a scenario where you know a well-trained uh, function oracle would be would would be able to interpolate between uh, two you know distinct protein families. And, I mean, and this is exactly what we're depicting here. 
Awesome. And Anna just wanted to clarify if the overall goal was to make a generative model that's uh, for naturally inspired diversity, if you could speak to that. Um, that's, a, that's another really good question. Uh, no. So <laughs> um, when we when we're when we're you know performing doing something like drug design, there are very um, particular edits to the sequence that may confer you know stronger or you know uh, higher binding specificity, um, and those regions those edits may be um, unobserved in natural sequences. For in, in the example of you know the OAS, you, I mean th these sequences arise out of uh, you know immunization studies. So, you know, some, some animal just em emitted these antibody sequences. And so those are natural. Um, and if, if these animals were emitting sort of, you know, viable drug molecules, then there would almost be uh, less of a um, sort of reason to perform this, uh, you know, this sort of sampling because you could sort of exhaustively search um, perhaps with some like, you know, intelligent heuristics and uh, you want, you know, you, you'd be able to essentially just find the best sequence in the, in, on the, you know, provided in the data. Um, but in the, you know, in the case of drug design, there are these very parsimonious edits that are going to, you know, satisfy a whole list of, you know, sequence liabilities and, um, you know, like positives, you know, they're, they're gonna have low, a low amount of negatives associated with the sequence. They're not gonna be toxic to your body. And they're also going to um, target antigen with you know, significant specificity. And so I would, I would say, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty confident in saying that uh, the, the idea is to not design natural, natural sequences, which runs uh, pretty, pretty uh, counter to something like this, this plot. Um, in general, you know, what, the, what, what we're trying to show here is that we are capturing the training distribution, but also in general, when we perform drug design, we're probably looking more at, at this region, um, meaning the, the sequences that have a, uh, have a more, a, a distinct log probability under, under, uh, under the, you know, sort of a, nat a naturalness metric. Um, so I hope that helps answer the question. Awesome. Uh, Rhea asks, do you expect that the performance slash sampling efficiency will vary a lot with protein function or observing differences? I guess between performance and sampling efficiency. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Um, do you expect that the performance um, or sampling efficiency will vary a lot with protein function? Um, yeah. Yes, I think I, I would expect that. If you have, um, I mean, the way I think about it is you take a noisy family of protein sequences. I, I don't know one off the top of my head, but say there's, there's essentially a sequence cluster that um, has been deemed to have, you know, some, some max sequence similarity, but there's still sort of high entropy in every region of the sequence. Then, um, what would happen is, you know, you, you train your model and you, you characterize this uh, sequence manifold, and it turns out that because of the, you know, the due to the you know high variabil variability in certain regions, when you when you apply this sort of like copyover, uh, you know, this copyover mechanism. What you might do is like you might just sort of fall through or fall off the manifold, and the reason why is that um, this what you know what you're what you what what's happened is that the embeddings are sort of sent very sensitive to perturbations due to the fact that there is like a, you know high entropy just in the data itself, and so to give a sort of one line answer to the question, it, you know. Depending on how high entropy your protein family is, uh, you might, meaning a long, you know, again, you consider sort of some like huge uh, alignment. 
um, and you and you and you think about sort of like what's changing here. If if you, if there's high variability, then you know performing these this sort of strange convex combination move in latent space, it may uh, it may uh, result in some kind of uh, sampling that uh, is not. It, you know, you're, you're you're essentially going. You know, you're going to decrease the sampling efficiency or something like that. You know, like the the, the viable sequences that you explore, due to the fact that you're sort of uh, like in an un, like in a generally uninformed parts of of your manifold, you might um, sort of uh, you would you might need to sample a whole lot of sequences so that you can uh, so that you can kind of correct for the correct for this. And uh, you know, basically fill in the gaps that were that were not um, seen in the in the data, or in, you know, they're not seen in, in only a few sort of samples. Um, Ria did post a follow up quickly before time. Um, as a follow up, could you motivate some intuition behind the design choices based on sampling for different protein functions, or do you think that it's just a matter of generalizing to localized distributions? Uh, yeah. So my my intuition is that antibodies, um, you know, since they are so well conserved, you know, that there are large swaths of the of the sequence, you know, the framework regions, even to some degree, like, like you know, these Bernier zones, they are a ideal sort of um, uh, testing ground and, uh, you know, a protein family to apply uh, the, the, this sort of sampling to. Um, and if there are other re other protein, you know, I I I, I know biology on epigenetics, and so uh, if there are other other protein families that are sort of you know exhibit this uh, this behavior, then they may be uh, you know also viable sort of um, uh, sequences or you know families for th this sort of sampling regime, and and you know. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's sort of my intuition. But the, uh, I would also say that perhaps for these um, these sequence these protein families that are more variable, uh, the better sort of um, framework to use is is the gradient guided design framework. The reason why is because there we can sort of assert that evolution in, uh, is quite informative. And the, you know, the the annotated function of a of a protein in a certain family is co correlated with the annotated function in a, in a different family. And so what this what this oracle learns is something like, um, you know, it's able it's able to leverage this in all all of the data there and like you know create a uh, a data manifold that sort of captures. Um, it, you know, certain regions of this manifold are enriched in sequences of certain uh, certain family, certain functions, and and other other regions are informed are, are enriched in other uh, re, uh, sorry uh, functions. And so, what I would say is that you know, in the case of uh, you know something that is like pretty highly or less conserved than sort of the antibody sequence. Uh, I, I would I would propose you know instead of kind of applying this gradient gut design framework wherein you essentially are able to leverage you know all you know more more information um, and like the evolutionary sort of uh, co you know co, co co evolution of different you know, protein families and um, perhaps there you know. You know why? Why? Did, why were we able to interpolate between these two these two structures? It's uh, it's likely due to the fact that embedded in in this this sequence family is information about something like this fam this family. Like you know you, you know you can get pretty far with saying this family is very not like this family, and so therefore I know how to move along this manifold in order to not satisfy th these uh these criteria and. And like I, I'm given more clues on how to satisfy this criteria. And as you get closer to this family, you know, 
what, what you see in practice with this gradient guided design is that it converges quite quickly. So, you know, it's going to basically make some huge move on the manifold and then another a small move and then another smaller and smaller and then eventually kind of lands in a local minimum that is a uh, corresponds to the sequence of the, the sequences that uh, you're interested in. And it's all sort of informed by this evolutionary information. Awesome. Well, that brings us to time. Uh, Dan, thank you so much for being with us today and talking about DMS with us. Uh, just to remind everybody, we will have Dan back as well as our previous speakers, Clara and Jonathan, in two weeks on November 15th uh, for a discussion moderated panel. So any questions you didn't get answered today, please feel free to save those and come back in two weeks. Other than that, thank you so much for attending today and we'll see you guys later. Thank you.